first three bars here, which are coronary calcifications when you're 100, these are pretty low risk. Uh, so you're probably justified in not shooting them. Now, what's the story with this bar here? And uh, to do this, I actually went in the last week and built and did the numbers about does this represent these um, people who have a low cardiovascular risk of a score greater than 3 to 100? Well, basically, there's 25 of these people. So 25 over about 2,400. There's only about 1% of them with this score. You actually look within that, what happened to those people. Uh, three of them had coronary events. Six people altogether died who were in that uh, particular bar. So they have a high, relatively high risk of death, but from a public health standpoint, they're a really tiny part of the population. Those six people who died are Six who the three who developed coronary disease, uh, that's um, or the died from coronary disease, that's one in eight hundred. So uh, to me, that makes me feel comfortable that uh, if they have a low cardiovascular risk score at this age, you know, in, in this particular study, um, then we are justified in not measuring the coronary calcium, and that saves us, uh, you know, eighty percent of the tests right there. Um, uh, about uh, last year, uh, Philip Greenland at Northwestern, who's a leader in this area, uh, published a paper you know, suggesting how we might use these data. And basically, it's the same thought process. If you're at low risk, you don't need a statin, uh, and you don't need a coronary calcium score. If you're at a higher risk, you need a statin, and you don't need to have your coronary calcification measured. If you're in mid-risk, um, this is informative. And this is just the model. These are no formal guidelines here. And uh, finally, I want to put up the uh, uh, actual expert panel that uh, this group put together. And you know, the recommendations, I mean, there's a lot of devil in the details, but it's the same idea that using um, cardiovascular risk, you can um, make decisions, better informed decisions about when you measure coronary calcification and when you don't. And at the low end you don't, at the high end you don't need to have a coronary calcium score to decide to treat. It's uh, somewhere in the mid-range. So I think Cardi has helped to inform this uh, and the last two slides I've shown you are very consistent uh, with this picture. So that assessing risk is really, really important in making a decision about one third a um, coronary calcification stand will help you out. Um, I, um, and uh, this sort of summarized that, uh, what we've seen here, and I think we're you know, pretty close. We've got a good idea what effective strategies are, what formal guidelines might be. I don't know, but you've got the picture here. Um, I want to say one final word here about uh, healthy lifestyle prevention. These are uh, Life Simple 7 from the American Heart Association. Uh, they're a pretty obvious healthy diet, physical activity, maintain ideal body weight, no sleeping, normal blood pressure, normal blood cholesterol, normal fasting, food dose. And I wanted to ask a question before I go to my last slide, is how many people here are involved uh, in either pediatric care or a lot of their work involves children and adolescents? One back there, two here, three. Okay, we got a couple of people here. Um, and to me, I think we need to have a, a lot more people because cardiovascular disease is lifelong. We need to work on uh, prevention. Prevention starts at the beginning of life. Um, and so you can see that only 40% of uh, uh, adolescents have a uh, even, even five of these factors, you get to adults, the numbers drop off or So this is uh, where a big part of our answer is. So thank you very much. I didn't know what my was doing.
things change and you have to be dynamic in your planning. So we have, um, we're just going to have a slight switch in the schedule because our friend from the governor's office, Richard Figueroa, who I've actually worked with since 1997, uh, needs to leave here by one. So we're going to ask Brian to tee up Richard Figueroa's slides. And I hope you'll forgive me, uh, crowd, and, uh, and Joe Sky, the Air Force guy. <laughs> 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 but we did just come up with a legislative proposal during, uh, so we'll work on that later. Thank you, uh, Steve, Sydney. We'll, we can all ask Steve questions later. Uh, but meanwhile, um, I'll just say that Richard Figueroa has been part of every important legislative discussion on health care since before I moved back from Washington State. Okay, uh, actually, I started working with him when I was working in Washington State for the Health Care Policy Board. He called me, I didn't know him, and he says, I understand you're, you are really into risk adjustment and reinsurance, and uh, I have some questions for you. And we just started you know, this fast friendship over math, basically, and insurance. He has an MBA from UCLA, and he has um, uh, a long and storied record at the Capitol. Many of you who ever worked on legislation have spent a lot of time with this guy. So if we want to do anything legislatively, we can come back to him. But meanwhile, let's hear what his latest plans are that they're cooking up in the Newsom administration. Richard is in charge of Medi-Cal, and he's in charge of the Department of Health Care Services. He's on loan from the governor's office. He is the Cabinet Secretary for Health and Veterans Affairs. Thank you, Richard, for being here. Um, again, it's the governor that, that 
you know, and again, there are probably some of you a little older than me here, but um, you probably have to go back to Earl Warren or sometime a long time ago to figure out like what the governor actually ran on health coverage or health care as, as a major feature um, of, uh, of that person's election. And then not only does health care, but single payer health care, which as you know is, is a really controversial aspect. The governor's never defined what that is. But again, it, is a, a, it does mean something different than just universal coverage. It's, it's you know, if you make more government involvement in either financing so um, in July, the governor signed legislation which established the Healthy California for All Commission. Um, if the healthy for, Health for All and Healthy California All sounds a little like California Endowment, Health for All and Water for All and This for All, it is for all because Daniel Zingali, who is my boss at the Endowment, is the governor's chief communication strategy. So lots of TCE-isms, lots of California Endowment stuff uh, infused in, in our overall health communication campaign. Um, but again, what they're supposed to do is in two pieces. First, take a look at, it's, it's basically about looking at what, what kind of structural underpinnings we need in California to move to a single payer system, whatever that is. So, you know, is it, what kind of system do we need? What kind of structures do we need? <coughs> what kind of departments and operational expertise do we need to kind of get us from here to there? Part of it is also taking a look at, at what, what's, um, what's the current, our current structure of healthcare delivery systems and financing look like in California. Um, we're a highly integrated um, system versus other states and lots of other things that kind of make us unique in the way that we deliver, we deliver care. Um, what are the different cost drivers in the system? Obviously the kind of chronic illnesses you're talking about today are major cost drivers in the system as well. So kind of what are the underpinnings of this whole thing? Um, and it's supposed to have an environmental analysis, kind of like what does the current system look like? Um, and that's due by July 2020. And then a, a key considerations report for how to move forward by February 2021. So that's there, and we'll be announcing uh, relatively soon here um, the, the composition of the, the commissions so that can kind of get, get going and get their work done. Um, and this is the Healthy California all, for All framework, affordable meaningful coverage, access to high quality care, and then whole person care, which again has that kind of social determinants, whole person care um, uh, uh, structure. The second thing I want to talk about real quick is Medi-Cal itself. <laughs> so Medi-Cal, as you know, every five years or so um, does like a major rethink of, of who it is and how it wants to move forward. That's typically in the context of a uh, federal, what they call 1115 waiver, which is these kind of large scale waivers, which, which lets California experiment and do different things in the Medi-Cal program. Um, so we're at that point again, um, the, the current Medi-Cal waiver, which, include, which is primarily focused on um, public health systems, primarily county public health, system, and particularly those that have public hospitals. Um, this is a little bit different. The feds have kind of changed the rules around um, how, they, how they will determine what's called cost neutrality. And so we have a lot less flexibility to go down what's called the 1115 waiver path than more traditional paths like managed care waivers and home community based waivers that most states use. So we kind of took a look back, tried to figure out kind of where we wanted to go, and have come up with what's called CalAIM. Um, Another old hat of mine, I used to work for the Manager's Medical Insurance Board, Leslie Cummings used to be my boss over there as the Executive Director, and AIM used to stand for the Access for Infants and Mothers Program, so uh, in the old days. But now it's CalAIM, it's renewed, Leslie. It's now in Advancing and Innovating Medicaid. It's the industry new um, Anyway, so this is um, a very comprehensive and ambitious framework. Um, it has major, it's four major features that focus on managed care, behavioral health, dental, and then other county programs and services, has a whole number of, of guiding principles, and again, you can see a large infusion of the social determinants of health um, in there. And then we have a very, very strong stakeholder engagement process that goes on between um, now and then. This is very different, because it's a lot more, it's a lot more internal focused than it was before. Um, there's lots of things about kind of streamlining um, even our administrative processes in Medi-Cal, as well as trying to take to the whole population of things that counties were doing before, like whole person care um, and uh, the home health pilot. So instead of doing like pilot work in counties, we're taking our learnings of things like whole person care and going to be taking them statewide. There's two major different yes, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, there, there's two, there's two major um, things I would, I would, they're maybe um, relevant to this particular group here. There are two specific benefits or set of services that we're, we're seeking to add statewide for all 13 million Medi-Cal recipients. And one's called enhanced care management. And that is 
there would be a much broader set of, of case management um, tools than that we've had before, again, building off the whole person care plots and things we learned at the local level. Um, the other one's called in lieu of services, which is not a very sexy name, but but it is for like, it's like, more like wraparound services for a particular population. So for example, we're gonna try for the first time to get the feds to allow us for like homeless individuals to give them temporary housing vouchers and housing transition services. Things like that which we know they're gonna need in order to main, to be healthy and to main, maintain themselves in the community and reduce the amount of ER um, use that we see. We, we, we kind of re, um, eliminate or reduce the revolving door between the justice and you know, homeless, justice involved population, incarceration. And then, and then part of this actually requiring the counties um, if they're going to be in a justice uh, in, the, in the justice system, to mandatorily link them and give them a warm handoff back to the health system, back to a health home, back to a place that they know because they have behavioral health needs or are using math services for substance abuse uh, in, in uh, public facilities to make that, that warm link back. So again, I won't get into all the details of things. Those are two things, and of course, for persons with um, with heart disease and diabetes and asthma and other chronic conditions. Um, these are, are very, very good uh, set of services. Our set of services. And again, there's like you know ten services under one. But sort of, I'm not going to go into all the various services. But there's like a the whole document's like 180 pages, and there, we just put up some for the Reader's Digest folks here. You know, me myself. Um, there is. <laughs> is Reader's Digest still exist? Is all online? Yeah. Is it all online? yeah. If I go to my grandma's house. A wall, you know, National Week after the walls of National Week five months got the walls of Reader's Digest. Anyway, um, so I, I would, we would put up some very short PowerPoints that can be used by anybody here to explain kind of what Cal Aim is about. We put them up on last Thursday or Friday. Um, so there's some, some Reader's Digest versions of these things as well. But again, these are major undertakings um, that, that we're going to be taking. We're going to look at like full integration pilots where you're going to integrate both physical health, behavioral health, and dental all in one uh, in the future. We'll be rolling all of long-term care into managed care. So just a lot, a lot of things are incorporated um, in this very large, like, it's like a redo of some, some of the basic ways we've looked at, at doing. Um, one of the reasons we're doing these things, and I'll stop, um, is that we know that, that you know, if the people in California are going to entrust government with doing more, either on the financing or the delivery side of things, we kind of have to get our house in order a little bit more. Um, given the medi is like the biggest state program that we have, and people are looking like, well, how, does, how do you expect me to be interested in this other thing if this thing has these issues and things like that? Even basic things about getting better addresses on people. Um, because if you go to Kaiser, which I remember forever and ever, you know, every time that you see them, they say, I want to confirm your address, I'm going to confirm your phone number. You know, county welfare offices are, don't see people that often in the system. The state relies on lots of other systems. So even like basic things so that we get any better addresses and things so even set out like healthy reminders we think we have to work on. So again, a lot of this is like, how do we gear up for a big, beautiful tomorrow with rainbows and unicorns and things like that? Um, as well as just, you know, really kind of taking the learnings around the social determinants and actually try to embed them in a more permanent reimbursement stream for individuals to make sure that it isn't just a pilot, it isn't just a one-off, that you move this county to this county, you don't lose the same benefits. Really trying to embed these things in a more permanent reimbursement stream to honor the work that many of you already know and already been doing, but never been reimbursed for. So again, that will require more general fund um, than maybe we have before, but um, the governor's allowed us to release this, this you know, basic framework um, as a market that he's very interested in taking with Medi-Cal kind of to the next level in what we population. So, I know never to get to be treating people at the lunch. That's always a really, really bad idea. Um, I try to keep on time. Yes. So, Hattie, how do you want to do this, Hattie? Well, have lunch? Since, since you have to scoot to yes. um, our next meeting at the Capitol. I have a meeting with the Assembly. Um, the the Medi-Cal program is, is doing, is like turning 180 degrees than it's ever been. And instead of trying to um, uh, carve in prescription drugs, we're actually carving them out for the first time. Again, so we have a uniform benefit system across counties and the same formulary, the same mechanisms. Um, but because I've lost the legislative interest, I could see the Assembly Health Chair at 132 talk about prescription drug centers. And, it's, and we should have you come back and talk about that at great length at this forum in the future, because there are a lot of strong 
and differing feelings. I'm sure there are. We've <laughs> <laughs> heard them all. We've heard them all. So, well, maybe not all. <laughs> so what we're going to do now is we're going to invite you to come back to the reception this evening and to grab some lunch here with everybody else. And if people have a chance to talk to you while you're grabbing your lunch, we want you to start to death. I, I occasionally, yes, yes, we need to make sure that our leaders are um, not starving like we all are. <laughs> <laughs> we need to make sure that he's got his head on straight. So let's let Richard get first in line. Oh and we're going to uh, then follow him in the buffet line with a beautiful salmon lunch. And then we'll reconvene here as soon as you get your lunch. And just Thank you, folks. I appreciate it. Content. I, I hope that you'll forgive me. How are you? Leslie, a new aim. Can you handle it? Can you handle a new aim? There's only so many letters in the alphabet. I know, I know, I know. I think of you. I don't bother you. But I think of you. Hi, Andy, how are you? Yeah. Our running is too late in time. So once you